Hi, this is your host, Upnil Bharatiya, and welcome to another episode of your Let's Talk. And today we have with us once again, Zach Pitcher, founding engineer at Tetrate. Zach, it's great to have you on the show. Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me back. Yeah, and today we are going to talk about a lot of things, including uh, one of the conferences that you folks will be hosting with NIST uh, and the Department of Com- uh, Commerce in May, which will be in uh, my home turf, which is DC. Uh, before we talk about the conference and all those things, uh, I want to talk a bit about Zero Trust because, first of all, we have been talking about security the whole cultural shift we have been talking about zero trust network zero track architecture but these terms evolve as the industry also evolves so talk a bit about when we talk about zero trust today what does it mean in fact actually in, in coinciding with this event we actually just published uh nist sp 80207a very excited about that that 207 series is what governs zero trust so 80207 is zero trust architecture uh so I was very excited to be able to write the next installment in that Zero Trust series. And that paper, which we released for public comment about two weeks ago, will be kind of one of the focal points of that conference in, in D.C. later this month. In that paper, I really tried very hard to, to do a couple things. One, introduce nothing new. Uh, but to give us a real practical hands-on definition for what zero trust is at runtime. So I want to be clear, there's more than just runtime when it comes to zero trust, but there's a lot of interfud around technology and tools and things, and I want to help, help give us some definitions to cut through that. So first off, in a broad uh, you know, categorization, what is zero trust? It is the people process and the the uh, you know technology and and um, business process in place to be able to mitigate an attacker being inside the network. So that's the mental model, right? So traditionally, we thought about security from the perimeter. How do I stop the attacker from getting in? Zero trust acknowledges the attacker, a motivated attacker, can get in the perimeter. What do we do to mitigate what that attacker can do? once they're inside. So that's the mindset, right? They're inside, the perimeter is not sufficient, so I need to take steps at every hop, at every at every service, at every instance to make sure that that attacker is limited in the data that they can egress, in the systems that they could try to compromise, and the other systems that they could pivot to. We want to bound an attack in space and in time. So philosophically, that's what we want to do. At runtime, how do we do this? In 207A, the the new paper, we introduce what we call identity-based segmentation. And that is five policy checks at runtime that we want to have happen on every single hop. So we don't want to apply these just at the front door, you know, maybe at our API gateway. But we want to do this for every single hop in our infrastructure. And those five things are encryption and transit, service identity and service authentication, service authorization. So we want, and, and why do we want these? And, and I'll, well, let me do the other two. End user authentication and end user authorization. So those are the five policy checks. So why do we, why do we need or want those? Encryption in transit is really for two properties. One, we want eavesdropping protection. We don't want other people who, you know, maybe are looking at the bits on the wire to be able to see what we're sending because the data is sensitive. And two, we want, uh, we want message authenticity. We want to make sure that, that the message you received is the message I sent. So we need encryption to provide both of those. Then we want to know what applications are communicating. And we want policy that governs that. So we want to say the front end can call the back end and the back end can call the database, but the front end can't call the database directly. And then we want to know who's the user in session. So, you know, we want to know that it's Zach that is logged in to the front end and that in this current session, you know, Zach has a read scope. Therefore, we're allowed to get the data from the database via the back end. So all of that together gives us you know, this protection on the wire and it helps us bound an attack in space. Service authorization policy helps us do that and bound attack in time, right? The, the credential expiry and those pieces help us do that. 
So overall, this gives us a pretty concrete definition. Hey, if you do those five checks at runtime, you're, you're in a good spot and you're achieving what we call identity-based segmentation, which we argue is zero trust at runtime. You can do more, but you need to do at least those. As you're talking about, it's a lot about culture, a lot about practices as well. Uh, but we, 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 we look at it as a mix of tools and proper practices to get best out of those tools as well. With, without each other, it's not going to practice itself. is not going to actually practice it does help a lot, but we need right tools also. Uh, you folks have a platform that does provide zero trust application connectivity and security through service mesh and service mesh plays a very big role when it comes to security. So talk a bit about when we look at service mesh, when we look at Tetrate, what role is service mesh playing in strengthening security and compliance and how once again, service mesh, you know, is just, you know, there are a lot of projects around, you know, that you can look at STO, LinkedIn, whatever you talk, but how Tetrate A is kind of helping users take advantage of these tools and technologies. So a couple of different pieces there. So first, why service mesh to help do this, to help with this aspect of security? Um, this is actually something that my other line of NIST papers talks about quite a bit. So the 207 is is the fourth NIST paper that I've that I've helped author. The other series is the 80204 series. And this is really all about microservice security and multi-cloud. Uh, that's really where I started working with NIST. And in those papers, we argue that the service mesh is the most effective uh, the most effective set of technologies in the microservice architecture to be able to provide security guarantees. And in those papers, we argue that the service mesh kind of forms the security kernel for a modern distributed system. In the same way you think about the kernel providing security features for processes and applications that we're running together, and we can trust that because it's a small audited set of code that is being reused to provide security for many different applications. The service mesh provides that same primitive in the distributed system. So that's why we focus on the service mesh as a technology to help implement a bunch of different controls. So certainly those five things for identity-based segmentation, the service mesh can help you implement. And we provide Tetrate Service Bridge, which is an enterprise offering that really brings the management capabilities that you're used to in something like AWS for managing an AWS service for being able to manage the service mesh on-prem. So that user login, the user access permissioning, who can do what, where, and what are the, the safe configurations that the service mesh can take are all the capabilities that we bring. And we do that across your entire infrastructure and not just one mesh deployment. And so that then lets you build controls and guidelines using the mesh as the technology to implement those controls and then let your developer go. And because you have kind of the bounding box of safe configuration there, your development teams can iterate within that bounding box as fast as they want. You know they're going to be safe. Irrespective of tools or specific technologies, what advice do you have for users in, in today's world so that they can have a very good security posture to ensure that their workloads application environments are secure? What is your advice? Yeah. So there's there's a basic process that we want to follow regardless of the technologies that we're using. So first we wanna inventory what we have. We need to know what our, our real estate is, right? We then need to be able to monitor that in ideally in real time, right? So we want to know what's there. Ideally we wanna know who owns it in the organization. We wanna know what it's doing at runtime. And then we can start to build more sophisticated capabilities on top to do things like continuously monitor so we can react, so that we can reduce our time to identification. Then we want to build tools for remediation. So we need to be able to identify, you know, know what's there, know what normal is, identify when things are not normal, and then be able to take action to return the system to normal. And so that's the, the core set of capabilities that we need to develop, regardless of the technology that you use to achieve those capabilities. And, you know, that gives us then a blueprint for where do we start? You know, I guarantee you as an organization, you probably don't know what you actually have. 
in terms of both the physical infrastructure and the software and where that software is coming from. So that's the place to start from a security perspective as an organization that, that's, that's trying to mitig- minimize risk. Inventory what we have, figure out what's there, and then we can build a plan of attack from that. Otherwise, you're taking stabs in the dark. How much of this you are seeing organizations are actually doing in practice, or you feel that they are still behind, we need a lot of education so that, or you're like, no, they're all moving in the right direction. They're they're all doing the right things. Yeah, I wish, uh, you know, in general, I think as an industry, we're trending in the, in the right way. Uh, but, you know, equally, we're also building more complex applications in more complex environments. So the, the challenge gets harder uh, as well. Um, Really, what I see is, in in I view, one of the other big purposes of the NIST papers is really to help educate. And it's both to help educate, you know, security decision makers, but it's equally to help educate the auditors and regulators that are evaluating systems. And so a lot of what we talk about in 207A, and and there's kind of three big ideas. I talked about identity-based segmentation. We additionally talk about how we want to layer new identity-based policies on top of existing network policies, not replace them. And and in doing so, we can relax the network policies and get some agility, for example. So, you know, our purpose in these papers is not to break new ground, but it's to talk about how we can do the right thing that we've been doing in the modern context. And in that way, educate and move the ball. So my goal, you know, what we see is that there are a lot of folks that are doing this. There are a lot of folks that are starting to overlay identity-based policy on top of their traditional network-based policy. You know, we even help customers that do this gain agility while they do it because we can relax network-oriented controls in favor of identity. The canonical example I give is the firewall rules between on-prem and cloud. Right. And in a bunch of folks that we work with, you know, that's a six week process. I file a ticket to get the firewall rules updated and I get the subnets and and all that. And, you know, the firewall team goes to the spreadsheet. That's the source of truth and maps the siders back to services, back to teams to figure out, do I allow this or not? One of the patterns that we talk about in 207A and that we implement is putting identity aware proxies on either side of the firewall. So that way we have one firewall rule that says, hey, the identity aware proxies can communicate. And then we can use identity based policy to decide who can go over that connection. And that's an example case study that we talk about in 207A in that paper. So to answer your question, you know, in general, as an industry, we're moving to in the right direction. There are definitely some people that are far ahead of others. And what we're and, and some of the folks that we work with are those. And what we're trying to do is kind of pull and drag the rest of the industry into this better world and using things like these SPs helps give the weight to make that okay from the perspective of of auditors and regulators. Let's talk about the conference that you folks are co-hosting with NIST and Department of Commerce in a couple of weeks and once again in my home turf, DC. Talk about that. We're super excited. This will be the fourth annual conference that we get to exclusively co-host with NIST. Um, You know, we have a a deep relationship there in the form of a collaborative research agreement in addition to the writing that we do together. And we leverage that to help bring these ideas, these techniques, and these technologies to industry. And so that's the whole point of this conference, which will be in person in downtown D.C. on uh, the 25th of this month. And there will be some workshops on the 24th. And for folks that care about continuous compliance and the authority to operate, there's another paired sister conference that will be happening on the 23rd. So all of that is great. So come for continuous compliance hands-on workshop, uh, uh, workshops around using the mesh and around continuous compliance, and our conference on the 25th that will be covering zero trust and multi-cloud specifically. We, the goal here is, is really for both decision makers and practitioners to be able to come and learn about what some of the other large organizations in both the public and private sector are doing, how they're approaching zero trust, Uh, some of the cultural change, some of the technology change, some of the tools and technologies for achieving it. 
Um, so, you know, we would love to have folks attend if you're in the area. It's also going to be streamed online, uh, and I believe it'll be available for free. Certainly, everything will be recorded and will be available after the fact as well. And all the previous year's conferences are available, too. So if you want an idea what what it's going to be like, if you just search you know, on, your, on your preferred browser, uh, go search for NIST Zero Trust Conference, you'll see multiple years worth from 2019 till, till this year's with all the program there that you can go kind of see and get a flavor for what the conference is like. Zach, thank you so much for taking time out today and uh, discuss this topic, uh, of course, standard and the upcoming conference. Uh, as usual, I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And, and again, yeah, look forward to seeing folks at the conference at the end of this month, May 25th. Thanks, everybody.